The star of our show this time is one of the most remarkable proteins in virtually all higher animals, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein in red blood cells that carries the oxygen from the lungs to the tissues. Its lesser known function is to haul away carbon dioxide from those same tissues. This is not as simple as it might sound. In the presence of oxygen in the lungs, hemoglobin changes shape to bind as much oxygen as it can. Elsewhere in the body, hemoglobin changes shape again to fine-tune delivery of oxygen. Less to tissues with low oxygen needs and more to tissues with high oxygen needs. Even more remarkable, the hemoglobin in fetuses differs from mom's hemoglobin, thus allowing the growing fetus to obtain sufficient oxygen from the maternal bloodstream. Taking a close look at this one protein reveals how it works and gives a good sense of how structure and function are intertwined for proteins. Our cells need oxygen to efficiently obtain energy from food. While some microbes survive in anaerobic environments, that is, without oxygen, their use of foodstuffs is inefficient compared to us. This is why animals have oxygen-carrying proteins to provide a steady supply of oxygen. Almost every vertebrate has hemoglobin as the oxygen carrier in their blood. The only exceptions are ice fish, which have a metabolism rate one-tenth that of other fish and live only in oxygen-rich Antarctic waters. Though hemoglobin is the best known oxygen binding protein in the body, a related protein called myoglobin is found in heart and skeletal mus muscle where it functions as an oxygen reservoir. Myoglobin is great at holding on to oxygen, but has issues with letting go. Only when the oxygen concentration gets very low does myoglobin release its oxygen. The different roles these two oxygen binding proteins play is reflected in their structures, as was discovered in 1958 when hemoglobin and myoglobin became the first proteins to have their 3D structures determined. Both myoglobin and hemoglobin are globular proteins with bends and turns bringing amino acids not necessarily close in primary structure of the protein into close proximity in the tertiary structure. Myoglobin is a single polypeptide containing 154 amino acids. They fold into eight helices connected in between by proline-rich loops. The result is a distinctive globin protein structure. Hemoglobin has a similar secondary and tertiary structure, but it adds a crucial quaternary structure. This is because hemoglobin contains four polypeptide subunits, making it a tetramer. Myoglobin was a monomer. Hemoglobin has two identical alpha subunits, each with 141 amino acids arranged in seven helical regions. There are also two identical beta subunits, each with 146 amino acids divided into eight helical regions. Alpha and beta globins are simply names for the polypeptides of hemoglobin. Please don't confuse them with the alpha helices and beta sheets in secondary structure. I will refer to the polypeptides as alpha and beta globins or subunits to avoid confusion. Hemoglobin is like a quartet of four closely coupled myoglobins. Remarkably, the number of amino acids in the alpha and beta subunits, respectively, remain the same for virtually all animals, 141 and 146, while the pre precise sequence of amino acids differs increasingly with evolutionary distance. Humans and chimpanzees, for example, have identical hemoglobin sequences, but humans and horses have alpha or beta subunits that differ by a couple dozen amino acids each. Humans and chickens diverge almost twice as much again. Proteins performing specialized tasks often need help from non-protein components called cofactors. And the cofactor in hemoglobin is called heme. It is the heme portion of hemoglobin that binds oxygen, while it's the polypeptide chains that modulate how it binds oxygen. Let's consider heme for a minute. The distinctive ring structure is found in molecules classified as porphyrins. There's a family of genetic disorders known as porphyria, where porphyrins build up excessively. 
treatment for skin porphyria includes reducing exposure to sunlight, and this fact has led to weekly supported suggestions that Vlad the Impaler of 15th century Romania, also known as Vlad Dracula, might have been averse to sunlight because of this peculiar aspect of hemoglobin metabolism. In hemoglobin, each globin subunit is covalently linked to the ring structure of heme. The best way to see the heme portion of hemoglobin is from a top-down perspective. Here, an iron atom is prominently visible in the center of heme, held in position by coordination with four nitrogen atoms of the heme group. Let's take a closer look at what happens when hemoglobin binds oxygen. Here we can see that in addition to the coordination of the four nitrogen atoms, the iron atom is bound below by a histidine, which is part of the globin polypeptide. This attachment helps to secure the iron in the heme and is critically important. The oxygen binds above the plane of the heme, and this has a very tiny but extremely important effect on the entire hemoglobin molecule. It moves the iron atom upwards, pulling the histidine with it. Now, movement of the iron upwards would have little significance if iron wasn't attached to the histidine below. But since it is attached, the histidine and the rest of the chain connected to the histidine moves too. So what started as a tiny movement of oxygen results in the adjustment of the structure of the chain to which the oxygen has bound. But that's not all. When the first subunit changes shape on binding oxygen, its interactions with all the other subunits subtly change. And oh boy, is that important. The changed interactions with the other subunits cause them to change in response. What kind of change? Well, the subunits lacking oxygen become more receptive to binding oxygen, a sort of protein peer pressure, if you will. We say that the hemoglobin has converted from a taut or tense state of low oxygen affinity called the T state to a relaxed affinity called the R state. Each additional oxygen bound favors binding of subsequent oxygens until all four subunits have oxygens attached. We call this phenomenon cooperativity, where the initial binding facilitates subsequent binding, in this case of oxygens to hemoglobin. If I were nanoscopic, I'd really like to see how hemoglobin manages cooperativity. Now in myoglobin, the binding of oxygen to its heme group leads to the same pull on histidine, but it ends there because myoglobin only has one subunit and one heme. There are no subunits to interact with and thus no cooperativity. Why is cooperativity important? Well, speed and capacity. The hemoglobin passes through the lungs very quickly, so it's important to get loaded with oxygen during those few seconds. On average, a red blood cell does a complete circuit throughout your body in only 20 seconds. Plus, a fully loaded hemoglobin is better able to provide oxygen than a partially loaded one. Hemoglobin's ability to grab lots of oxygen very quickly is critical for animals that move a lot because of the greater needs of their muscles for oxygen. Let's think about what happens here. Hemoglobin goes racing through the lungs in the red blood cells. A single oxygen molecule binds there and tugs an iron, a fraction of a nanometer. And this results in the entire hemoglobin getting loaded with oxygen before it exits. Were it not for that minuscule change in iron's position, resulting in cooperativity, you and I would not be here marveling at this mechanism. In fact, there would be almost no vertebrates. This is nothing short of incredible. How hemoglobin's structure allows it to grab oxygen is fascinating, but we've just begun. Let's compare hemoglobin now with its simpler cousin, myoglobin. We'll start with the oxygen binding properties I just described, but now on a graph. Graphs like this are very helpful because with them we can quickly visualize what's going on. Focus first on the myoglobin on the left. On the y-axis we see the percentage of myoglobin bound by oxygen, and on the x-axis we have the concentration of oxygen. The oxygen concentration is expressed as the amount of oxygen available in millimeters of mercury. What happens when we increase the oxygen concentration, moving to the right on the graph? 
the percentage of myoglobin bound to oxygen also increases rapidly. This means myoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen. That's what we want from myoglobin. When we do the same experiment with hemoglobin, the graph has a different shape and it's shifted to the right. What's going on? We start with a low concentration of oxygen, two millimeters of mercury, and compare the percentage of myoglobin bound to oxygen versus that of hemoglobin. We see that at this low level of oxygen, that 50% of the myoglobin is bound to oxygen compared to only 2% of the hemoglobin. To get 50% of the hemoglobin bound to oxygen requires a much higher concentration of oxygen, about 27 millimeters, more than 10 times as much. So now we can see that at the same low oxygen concentration, myoglobin binds more oxygen than hemoglobin. Essentially, that means that myoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin and can take oxygen away from it. So this is something to look for in plots like this. A binding curve moved to the left indicates a greater oxygen binding affinity, like myoglobin, whereas a curve shifted to the right indicates a reduced oxygen binding affinity. And whenever you see a slight S-shaped curve like hemoglobin has, it means the affinity for oxygen is changing with increasing oxygen. That's what cooperativity makes possible. At very high oxygen concentrations, the two curves essentially merge, meaning at high oxygen levels, they're both full of oxygen. In the lungs, the concentration of oxygen is about 100 millimeters of mercury. At this high level, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen is essentially the same as myoglobin's. By contrast, in the tissues, the oxygen level is about 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury. So we can see that hemoglobin goes from a lower affinity for oxygen in the tissues to a higher affinity for oxygen in the lungs. This makes intuitive sense. When the hemoglobin is in the lungs, where there's plenty of oxygen, it needs to load up on the oxygen, so it has high affinity and loads up on oxygen. When the hemoglobin's in the tissues, where the oxygen is needed, it lets go of the oxygen bound to it due to lower affinity, thus supplying tissues with oxygen. A quick way to check the saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen is to use a device called a pulse oximeter, or pulse ox for short. A reading of less than 90% saturation is considered low. That translates to about 120 to 180 grams of oxygen per liter of blood. But remember, unlike red or white blood cells, hemoglobin is just a molecule, far smaller than a cell. A single red blood cell contains hundreds of millions of molecules of hemoglobin. Besides carrying oxygen, hemoglobin has other functions. It also picks up two sets of molecular baggage in the tissues and dutifully hauls them back to the lungs. Carbon dioxide is one type of baggage, a direct product of various oxidative processes in cells that create energy. Small quantities of carbon dioxide can be tolerated by cells, but at higher concentrations, it's toxic. Hemoglobin binds CO2 and takes it back to the lungs to be exhaled. Second, protons need to be removed, especially from actively metabolizing tissue, like working muscle. Protons, of course, come from acids. The more protons, the lower the pH. And acids, such as lactic acid, are byproducts of cellular metabolism. In fact, both protons and carbon dioxide are great indicators of cellular metabolism. The higher the rate of metabolism, the more these compounds are produced. So hemoglobin binds protons and carbon dioxide, and then later it delivers them to the lungs where they get released. Oxygen, of course, binds to the iron and heme, whereas protons and carbon dioxide instead are carried on the amino acid side chains of the globin subunits most commonly histidine. Now, interestingly, the binding of carbon dioxide and protons to hemoglobin also facilitates the release of oxygen from hemoglobin to tissues. The binding curves show what happens. The central line shows that hemoglobin's oxygen binding affinity under normal conditions of pH and carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide and protons go up, which means that the pH drops, the curve shifts to the right, 
indicating that hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen decreases. So when tissues are rapidly metabolizing, the protons and carbon dioxide they release bind to hemoglobin. This lowers hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, so it releases more oxygen to the tissues that need it. When tissues are not metabolizing rapidly, there are fewer protons and less CO2. So hemoglobin's binding curve moves to the left. That means higher oxygen affinity and less oxygen release, where it is not needed as much. This behavior of hemoglobin in response to metabolic conditions is called the Bohr effect for the scientist who discovered it, Christian Bohr. He was father to the atomic physicist Niels Bohr. Okay, so hemoglobin's pretty amazing, right? It quickly binds oxygen in the lungs and releases it in the tissues. And it reads the need for oxygen by the amount of carbon dioxide and protons it binds. But wait, there's more. Hemoglobin's release of oxygen is increased by yet another molecule produced abundantly by rapidly metabolizing tissues. Besides oxygen, protons, and carbon dioxide, hemoglobin can bind to a small compound known as 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or 2,3-BPG. On hemoglobin, 2,3-BPG only binds to one very specific site. Notice how hemoglobin has a donut-like shape with the hole in the middle. Well, that hole is where 2,3-BPG binds. Now look at the combined effects of protons, carbon dioxide, and 2,3-BPG, all shifting the binding curve to the right. Shifting the binding curve to the right on our graph indicates reduced affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, thus increasing the concentrations of protons, carbon dioxide, and 2,3-BPG all favor the release of oxygen. When 2,3-BPG binds to hemoglobin, though, it is important that it be released before hemoglobin gets back to the lungs. Otherwise, the hemoglobin will remain in the state of low affinity for oxygen and will not bind oxygen readily when it passes through the lungs. 2,3-BPG is not bound to hemoglobin covalently, so normally this little molecule readily detaches from hemoglobin during its journey back to the lungs leaving hemoglobin free to flip to the high affinity state when it gets to the lungs. Except in smokers. The concentration of 2,3-BPG in the blood of smokers is higher than in non-smokers, partly due to the carbon monoxide in tobacco smoke. So for a smoker, when a 2,3-BPG molecule gets released from hemoglobin on the way back to the lungs, there is a much greater likelihood another 2,3-BPG will bind to it in its place. It's a numbers game. As a result, smokers have a greater chance hemoglobin will have 2,3-BPG bound to it when it returns to the lungs. If this happens, hemoglobin is stuck in the low affinity T state and can't flip to the R state. As a result, it is much less able to bind the oxygen the body needs. This is why smokers easily get out of breath from mild exertion, like climbing stairs. The oxygen-carrying capacity of their hemoglobin is sharply reduced by the high levels of 2,3-BPG in their blood. Okay, does the carbon monoxide found in tobacco smoke have anything to do with the higher levels of 2,3-BPG in the blood of smokers? You betcha. Carbon monoxide has the formula CO, and for a hemoglobin, that CO looks an awful lot like an OO, or oxygen. In fact, carbon monoxide binds to the same iron as oxygen. And here's the kicker. It binds quite a bit more tightly than oxygen. That forces cells to burn a lot more glucose to make energy, and that in turn causes more 2,3-BPG to be made. It's a vicious cycle of sorts. Because of this, hemoglobin can't pick up oxygen in the lungs when CO, CO is bound. And as a result, some cells get starved of oxygen. So while smoking cigarettes may not produce enough carbon monoxide to kill you immediately, chronically low oxygen levels are a shortcut to heart disease. So far, we've seen that hemoglobin's ability to pick up and release oxygen is carefully regulated. Let's turn our attention to a related system at work during pregnancy.
Here, hemoglobin has to serve the mother and the developing fetus. The hemoglobin we've been talking about so far is adult hemoglobin. As we saw earlier, it has two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. A growing fetus also needs oxygen, but in the womb, its only source is mom's bloodstream. Since blood cells and hemoglobin don't cross the placental barrier, it is important that the fetus be able to take oxygen from mom's hemoglobin. Fortunately, the fetus has a slightly different form of hemoglobin that enables this. In fetal hemoglobin, the beta subunits of adult hemoglobin are replaced by two similar units called gamma. The same alpha units are made as in adult hemoglobin. The overall structure of fetal hemoglobin is called alpha-2, gamma-2. Fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than maternal hemoglobin, as you can see in the binding curve. The blue line shifted to the left is that of fetal hemoglobin, and shifts to the left indicate tighter binding or higher affinity. Fetal hemoglobin behaves much like adult hemoglobin with respect to cooperativity, as well as the binding of protons and carbon dioxide. But one difference is that fetal hemoglobin doesn't bind 2,3-BPG very well, and that's a good thing. Despite looking much like the beta globins of adult hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin's binding region for 2,3-BPG lacks a positively charged histidine, which is replaced by a neutral serine. This and other amino acid substitutions reduce the overall positive charge of the gamma subunit. Reducing the positive charges on the gamma subunit make it less likely that the negatively charged 2,3-BPG will bind to fetal hemoglobin. Since the fetal hemoglobin binds 2,3-BPG less frequently than maternal hemoglobin, the fetus's hemoglobin spends more time in the R state than mom's hemoglobin. Consequently, the fetus can literally take oxygen away from mom. Soon after a baby is born, its body stops making fetal hemoglobin as beta-globin production increases. The heme released in the switch is broken down into a compound called bilirubin, which gets disposed of by the liver. If a baby's liver is not able to process the bilirubin released as fetal hemoglobin is broken down, it accumulates in the blood leading to neonatal jaundice and a sickly yellowish appearance. Premature babies whose livers are insufficiently developed are most likely to have this problem. Although the fetus shifts hemoglobin production towards adult hemoglobin, a small amount of fetal hemoglobin continues to be made all the way into adulthood. This slightly ajar door affords an opportunity for helping individuals with sickle cell disease also called sickle cell anemia. Now, the word anemia refers to any deficiency of hemoglobin or red blood cells. The anemia in sickle cell disease is the result of a genetic condition in which red blood cells assume the shape of a sickle in capillaries. Sickle cell anemia was the first disease ever linked to a specific mutation, and it is a fascinating instance of how a very small change in a protein has profound effects on an organism. The sickling of red blood cells results from a mutation in the beta globin gene that causes aggregation of the hemoglobin molecules under low oxygen conditions, such as in exercise. The mutation responsible for the disease changes glutamic acid to valine in the sixth amino acid of beta globin. Thinking back to what you know about amino acids, you can see that a negatively charged glutamic acid would be on the surface of the beta subunit, but has been replaced by a hydrophobic amino acid, valine. Remember the tendency of hydrophobic side chains to hide away and associate with each other on the inside of a protein? In low oxygen conditions, the extra valine side chain on a mutant beta subunit surface interacts with those of other mutant hemoglobins, since they can't hide in the interior of the protein. The result is formation of long polymers of mutant hemoglobin that distort the shape of the red blood cell. And it takes a lot of polymerization to change the shape of a red blood cell. A single hemoglobin protein occupies a volume one one billionth that of a red blood cell. That's why it takes a lot of aggregation to affect the overall shape of a cell. 
Once cells take on the sickle shape, they get stuck in capillaries and block blood flow, depriving tissues of needed oxygen. The result is pain and cellular damage at a minimum. Chronic oxygen deprivation can lead to vision loss, damage to vital organs, and even death. Sickle cells are recognized as damaged and removed from the blood supply by the, by the spleen, causing the reduced red blood cell counts associated with anemia. So how could one treat such a disease? One approach is to try to increase the synthesis of fetal hemoglobin in adults. A drug called hydroxyurea has been shown, albeit with some side effects, to induce synthesis of fetal hemoglobin. Increased fetal hemoglobin synthesis in adults as a treatment for sickle cell disease has two targeted effects. First, it increases the amount of oxygen-carrying hemoglobin, so tissues can be better supplied with oxygen. And second, the increased numbers of gamma subunits interfere with the polymerization of alpha-2, beta-2 hemoglobin, reducing cell sickling. So we've seen that a change in the single amino acid in one subunit of hemoglobin can cause life-threatening disease. But this is only true for a person who inherits two copies of the mutant beta-globin gene, one from the father and one from the mother. Having only a single copy does not result in the disease. Tens of millions of people around the world are carriers of the mutation, having only one copy mutated, and such people have fairly normal lives. If two carriers have children, however, their kids will have a one in four chance of getting two mutant copies and thus developing this debilitating disease. Why then is there such a high prevalence of the sickle cell mutation in the human population? It turns out that having one copy of the hemoglobin mutation seems to protect against malaria. The prevalence of the sickle cell mutation is highest in regions of the world that have a high incidence of malaria. In such places, as much as 40% of the population carries a copy of the mutation. A study of sickle cell cases in western Kenya shows that individuals with one mutated beta-globin gene and one normal beta-globin gene had a better chance of survival of malaria than individuals with two normal beta-globin genes from the second to the sixteenth month of life. Now, how this combination of one normal hemoglobin beta gene and one mutant hemoglobin beta chain helps protect against malaria is complicated and not fully understood. But there are some clues. Mice with one mutant hemoglobin beta chain gene have more free heme in their blood, but they also have high levels of an enzyme called heme oxygenase 1 that acts to counter the free heme in the blood. It catalyzes production of small amounts of carbon monoxide. Now here it gets weird. The carbon monoxide it makes seems to be beneficial. The low levels of carbon monoxide inhibit development of malaria. Whatever the precise mechanism, millions of people who survive malaria owe their lives to this strange mutation in a gene for hemoglobin. Okay, let's wrap it up. Hemoglobin is the classic example for understanding how protein structure is critical to a protein's function. Tiny changes to the ring quartet of protein structure of hemoglobin shows how a protein can be switched on and off by molecules that signal when and how much its activity is needed. Variant hemoglobin such as fetal hemoglobin and mutated beta-globin in sickle cell anemia illustrate how different forms of a protein can have life-saving or fatal consequences. In our next lecture, we'll again see how structure and function are related in enzymes, a wide-ranging and crucial group of proteins that allow biochemical reactions to run amazingly fast.